All right, well, welcome to November's Mountain True University. Uh, my name is Cassidy Dunaway, and I'm an AmeriCorps member at Mountain True, and part of my job is to host these Mountain True University series. If this is your first Mountain True University, it is a speaker series where various members of our staff and friends of the organization give talks about areas that they work in or are interested in. If you are interested in finding some of the past recordings of Mountain True University, you can find them on our website. Today, we are going to hear from Mountain True's High Country Water Quality Administrator and AmeriCorps member, Hannah Woodburn, and Broad River Keeper, David Caldwell, as they discuss their ongoing studies focusing on the levels of heavy metal pollution in fish tissues. If you are not familiar with Mountain True, we are an environmental or conservation organization that works primarily in Western North Carolina to protect our resilient forests, our clean waters, and our healthy communities. Check out our website to find out more about what we do. Since this is a webinar, we cannot hear or see you, but you can hear and see us. If you have any questions during the discussion, feel free to type them in the Q&A below, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So I will go ahead and hand that over to David to get us started. Okay, thank you, Cassidy. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Hope this works. And go to, oh, I'm not finding it. Trying to get to the slideshow that Hannah put together. If you just click the tab, um, it's, yeah, the slideshow tab. Okay, wrong one. That'll get it up there. Okay, here we go. And thanks for this nice work, Hannah. <clears throat> so um, I'm your Broad River Keeper. I'm located in Lawndale, North Carolina, which is uh, Upper Cleveland County and the Broad River basically runs from around Lake Lure on the uh, coming off the uh, Blue Ridge Escarpment and it runs down through Rutherford County and then into Cleveland County and on into South Carolina. So I've been the Broad River Keeper now for three years, but I will give you a little bit of history first about how and why I became involved um, with the Duke Energy coal ash issue and also with uh, fish tissue sampling with Appalachian State University. Uh, first of all, I'm a fisherman and I've been fishing all my life and grew up fishing. And then um, after moving here about 30 years ago, I started fishing in the Broad River and I'll tell you a little story about um, the old timer, a uh, fellow that I met about 15 years ago. So I was on the way to fish in the Broad River one day and I stopped into a little uh, diner in Bowling Springs called uh, the Snack Shop. And I sat down at a lunch counter and um, beside this uh, older gentleman, I call him old timer. And I must have been dressed for fishing because he asked me if I was going to the river and I said, yes, I'm gonna go bass fishing. And um, so we started exchanging fish tails, you know. Uh, what's the biggest fish you call? How, what kind of fish do you like to catch? Stuff like that. And so we talked fishing for several minutes before our meals came out and were served. And um, I was getting kind of hungry. So I asked the guy, I said, um, I said, how do you like to cook your fish? Talking about smallmouth bass specifically. I said, I like to wrap mine in tin foil with a little butter and salt and pepper and put them on the grill. And he looked at me and he said, I don't eat those fish. And I said, well, why not? I said, you must like to eat fish. You fish all the time. It sounds like you have a good time doing that. You must like 
um, fish, and he said, Duke, Ener Duke, Duke Power has poisoned those fish. And I didn't know what to say. I don't think I said anything for the rest of the meal. I ate my lunch, went on to the river, I went fishing, probably caught fish, and but I didn't take them home. I was used to taking home the fish that I caught to eat, and um, that's what I've done all my life. So that really hit me hard, and for years then after that, and up to this day, I, I don't take many fish home from the Broad River anymore after talking to that old timer. So, but I kept going to the river, I kept fishing. And then in 2014, I met Hartwell Carson, who is our French Broad River Keeper. <clears throat> and he said that uh, Mountain True, which was then Western North Carolina Alliance, had intervened in a lawsuit between DEQ and Southern, um, DEQ and Duke Energy, um, trying to get Duke Power to excavate their coal ash at um, both the Asheville steam station and Cliffside. And Hartwell asked me if I'd like to get involved. And I said, well, yeah, you know, that now's my chance to make a difference in the quality of water and in the health of the fish and uh, our community members who eat those fish. So I testify as a standing witness um, in that case and was interviewed by both uh, Duke Energy lawyers and Southern environmental lawyers and basically told them, you know, my story and my investment in the river, which was basically as a sportsman, as a fisherman. <clears throat> so then um, a couple of years later, our North, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality offered a public comment session to be held in Bowling Springs, uh, co-hosted by Duke Energy, where concerned community members could show up and speak and, and um, state their concerns or ask questions, give comments about how the coal ash was gonna be handled um, in Cliffside. So I'm gonna skip forward to a couple couple of this next slide here. And so um, we contacted community members and one of which is um, Guy Hutchins here. He's a landowner on the Broad River. And um, he has a couple of properties in Cliffside and he had five whales, I believe, that were all contaminated um, with pollution from the coal ash pits. So the community members were definitely concerned about their drinking water. They were also concerned about the toxins that were being put into the river. And then the health of the community members as a result of those toxins, both in the groundwater and in the surface water, which is the river. And the coal ash at that time was currently being uh, contained in an online or several, three actually unlined basins right beside the Broad River. And so as community members, uh, we showed up and we told um, Duke Power and DEQ that we were not comfortable and thought there were big problems with this pollution and that we expected Duke Energy to excavate that coal ash and move it away from the river. So that first meeting was in 2016. And then there were a couple other meetings after that where our DEQ was trying to decide um, how to go forward with uh, making or requiring uh, Duke Energy to either cap in place or excavate their coal ash. <clears throat> so it's a couple of years later in, in uh, 2018, and the Appalachian State Ecotoxicology team, uh, headed up by Dr. Shay Tuberty, um, called me up and, and said they were interested in um, doing some analysis of water, sediment, and fish tissue samples 
as related to the coal ash situation in Cliffside. And of course I said, yeah, come on. So we, we went out and we, we caught some fish and they took um, samples back to App State and analyzed them. And then the next year in uh, January of 2019, um, bunch of people showed up for the last public meeting and four river keepers showed up. Um, we all spoke, spoke out about our concerns. And also Dr. Tuberby presented the data that had been gathered from that, that first um, visit, the first visit to the Broad River and the first collection of fish tissue. And he told the people there, he told DEQ and Duke Energy, he said, the proof is in the fish you're eating. And I feel like that statement and that data that Dr. Tubity put, put forward on that day really caught the attention of our North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. And four months later, DEQ mandated that Duke Energy excavate all the coal ash from the three uh, storage ponds in Cliffside and move it to lined landfills. And then, of course, Duke Energy fought that and it took um, another eight months. But finally, in uh, um, January of this year, Duke Energy agreed to fully excavate and safely store that coal ash. So, the, the bottom line for me is going back to the story of the old timer, I would like to some, someday become that old timer who can say with confidence to the young fishermen, yes, there's fantastic fishing in the Broad River and those fish are good to eat. Uh, so I'll just show you a map of the cliffside steam station here. Here's the um, Broad River running from uh, northwest to southeast. Here is the main um, coal-fired generating plant. This is a huge pile of coal. This is the original coal ash basin that was fairly small. It has already been fully excavated and moved across the road to this line, landfill here. Uh, the unit um, one, one through five basin is here. It's pretty, it's pretty much larger. I think there's two and a half million tons of coal ash here that will be excavated and moved to dry storage. And this pond, which still has water in it today, is called the Active Pond, and it was the biggest basin there. It's an 86 acre um, retaining pond and it contains five and a half million tons of coal ash. So that is the situation in Cliffside. All of this ash is gonna be dug up, moved away from the river and into dry line storage where it can be uh, safely stored for decades. So there, unfortunately, we there are other industrial operations that are polluting our Broad River. And it just so happens that um, in 2015, you know, just about the time I was really getting involved with the fight to remove the coal ash uh, from the riverside, we had a huge fish kill incident in the Broad River. Thousands of fish of all species and sizes were dying and they were dying right around the vicinity up and downstream of the cliffside plant here. So of course, you know, my first um, assumption was, gosh, something must be going on at, at Duke Power and they're poisoning the fish. So got to asking around again, asking community members and especially other fishermen who seem to be more concerned about this, what was then called horsehead, it's now called American Zinc. And this facility, um, the, the fishermen said they had really seen a decline in 
the fish population since this Horsehead Corporation opened up. So the uh, Horsehead Corporation opened up in, in uh, 2013. I did some research. I went to EPA's website and looked at their compliance history. And it turns out that um, for the first two years they were in operation, the American Zinc plant was non-compliant in their discharge permit, their NPDES permit, where they were uh, releasing their um, process effluent into the Broad River. So a lot of people came down, the EPA came down, Department of Environmental Quality, North Carolina Fish and Wildlife came down, everybody took water samples. Unfortunately, I don't, and I still don't understand that they did not take fish tissue samples or, or the few samples that they did take, they said the fish had um, decompo decomposed to the point that they were of no use anymore. So there was no determination made as to, no official determination made as to um, what had killed those fish. So then, with Appalachian State uh, ready to come back down, I handed them uh, two problems to look at. That would be the horsehead industry and uh, Duke Power and Cliffside. So I'm gonna let uh, Hannah tell you about that now. Sure, thank you, David. Um, let me get my screen up here. All right. So I, so the first year that App State sampled was in 2018, and I became involved with this project in 2019. Um, I was in the second Ecotox class um, looking at this issue, and that's where I met David, um, got involved with Mountain True, and ultimately like all the river keepers, which um, has been re a really great experience. So a little bit about how we collected the samples. Um, so we electrofished, and if you haven't heard of that before or don't know what it is, um, if you look at Dr. Tuberty, he has this backpack on and it has like a high powered battery. And then these are two um, poles with cathode and anode. And so basically it creates an electric field um, in the water and stuns the fish. So when the fish are shocked, um, we can easily scoop them up with nets and, um, in this, in most cases, um, you can return them to the river after you've like um, determined the species and length. But in this case, since we needed to analyze the tissues, um, we kept them to um, dissect them for research. <laughs> and so after we collected them um, and had the different sites, we stored them on ice and then filleted them um, back at the lab. And then we took water samples, um, and then those are stored on ice in the dark. And then we also took um, soil samples. So it's just kind of like a grab and go. Um, and then you, you, you take the GPS um, port coordinates at the sites um, when, you, when you collect. So here is a map um, from when we sampled in 2019. And if you see here, um, this was the old reference site. So the first group that came in in 2018, um, this was their reference site because um, they weren't concerned with American zinc products at that time. So there's about six and a half river miles between American zinc products and Cliffside. Um, so we have, we have um, that one sample that was taken there. And then we went back um, in 2019 and also took a sample there at the same, same area. Um, and then we took um, samples all the way down, just past the Broad River Greenway. And so you can kind of see how those are spread out and I'll reference these names in this map quite a bit just to orient you with the data that comes later um, in a few slides. But one of the reasons we have, um, not issues, but we would like to review the data and take a little bit of a closer look is because the reference site in 2019 was um, way up here on Highway 74 when it really should have been, um, you know, right, right upstream of American Zinc products. So um, one of the improvements that we're, we're planning to make and have made um, to go back in 2020 is to get a closer reference site. And I think um, the issue with the year before is 
there just wasn't clear river access um, along here, but this year we were able to make something work. It wasn't easy. We had to like basically climb a really uh, steep clay, clay um, uh, river bank, but we made it work. And so I'm really excited to see how that changes um, our interpretation of the reference sites. So um, there's me in the lab. Um, so once we have all of our samples collected and they've been stored on ice, um, we, we then take them from the regular freezer and take them to a freeze dryer. So um, the sediment and the fish tissue or the fish fillets go into this um, really high powered freeze dryer. And it's basically a vacuum that sucks out all of the water out of the samples. Um, so you're just left with this little dry, brittle, kind of like the space, space food, um, to give you kind of a reference about the material. So we do that for about anywhere from five to seven days um, until all the moisture and water is out of the samples. And then we um, process them in the MARS, which is a microwave accelerated reaction system. And so um, each, each um, soil, water, and fish samples are processed um, via different methods. And so basically what that equates to is just how long they spend in the microwave. So we put about um, 10 milliliters of nitric acid, which is what I'm adding here to the tube. Um, and we put them in these long tubes and there's this circular carousel that gets put into the microwave and the, the um, samples are you know, held anywhere from about 30 minutes to over an hour, um, the fish tissue takes a little bit longer to acid digest, which is what the process is called. And then from there, we're able to basically liquefy um, the fish tissue sediment. Obviously the water is already liquid, um, uh, but we add that with acid and we're able to make a concentration that is able to be read by the ICP, which is inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Property. <laughs> I know that's always a tongue twister, but um, essentially it's a chemistry instrument, um, really expensive, and um, you, feed, you feed the machine or instrument um, standards, and that way it knows like where to read, and then um, you put your samples in, and light is shot through this, um, I don't know, little hole, and then Based on the absorption of the light, um, we're able to get that concentration back. So that's that's a really watered down version of how it works. Um, it's really complex, but uh, essentially that's what gives us our results, which is what we really care about: um, concentration of metals that is that are found. So that leads us to our first um, graph. Uh, so here you can see we have the BR reference and then the BR old reference. And these are in chronological order to that map I showed a slide before. So um, the way that we're reading that is the way that the sites, um, you know, progress. And so the BR old reference is in between um, American Zinc products and Cliffside. So here we can see um, this line right here, the red line, um, shows the zinc freshwater aquatic life limit. Um, and then the blue line shows the lead freshwater life limit. And so as you can see, um, almost all of the sites either meet or exceed um, the lead for freshwater aquatic life, um, except for this old reference between, between the two sites, um, Cliffside and American Zinc products. And then here we see um, the zinc freshwater aquatic life limit and um, the reference site and the how the water sample taken at, at the house and then also um, the Broad River Greenway um, all exceed that. And something really interesting about this in general, um, as you can see, some of the highest one little drop of orange is going to be cadmium and then the gray is chromium. Um, but obviously we can see that there's high levels of zinc and lead. Um, and here we took a um, tap water sample at the house that we were staying at, um, courtesy of Guy Hutchins. 
um, who, who David mentioned earlier. Um, so we took a tap water uh, sample at his house at his request and um, the levels found there were almost double the EPA action level for drinking water. Um, yeah, so that was pretty surprising. And all of, and, and then again, all of his um, drinking water came from wells that were, you know, in the ground. And so the well water was contaminated because the groundwater was contaminated. Um, and here you have the results for the sediment samples. Um, again, we see a, a common trend um, with the zinc and then he, the lead here in purple. And then this, um, sorry, I'm trying to make that go away so I can see. Um, and then we see a slight bit of cadmium um, in the orange. And then um, the chromium, this light blue, um, it is significantly higher than uh, we found in the water samples. Um, and one of the main reasons we might see higher um, concentration on sediment is because metals can actually bind to sediment um, in, in a way that, um, you know, water can't do that um, or does it at a lower rate. And even though we see some pretty significant levels of metals um, in these sediment samples, there's not really, the, the criteria is so high that it, it didn't exceed any criteria, if that makes sense. So here we'll get into the fish. So, um, so we were looking at some of the signals. Actually, all of the fish collected exceeded the EPA criteria for the maximum allowable amount of chromium, which is 0.1 um, parts per million. So, yeah, every single fish that we collected had more chromium than is allowed by um, government regulatory agencies. Um, again, 98% of the fish collected um, exceeded the EPA criteria for arsenic toxicity um, for cr chronic human consumption. Um, so that means long-term regular consumption, um, which ranges from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 parts per million a day. Um, so all the fish we collected were above those levels. And then 100% of the fish collected exceeded the EPA criteria for selenium toxicity. Um, now for cadmium, so 31% of the fish um, exceeded the World Health Organization criteria um, for the monthly limit of cadmium. And 100% um, of the fish we collected um, exceeded the daily limit for cadmium consumption. Um, all the fish exceeded the recommend, recommended daily amount for zinc um, for women and men. And then um, we found increased levels uh, in ovary samples. So um, not only did we take a muscle sample when we played the fish, if we um, were dissecting the fish and found ovaries, um, we, we collected those and um, ran them through the same process as well, and then um, got the results back. And with many of our um, other metals, lead, um, selenium, we also found that there were higher levels um, or higher concentrations found in the ovary than the tissue of the fish that it came from. And that is due to um, bioaccumulation. So uh, as biological processes take place, um, higher concentrations build up. So um, as, as fish reproduce, there's going to be more um, metal, you know, higher concentrations of metals in the offspring than there would be the, the fish that, you know, the original like mother fish. <laughs> um, and then 33, 33% 33 of the fish um, exceeded the European Union European Union criteria for lead toxicity, which is um, 0.3 parts per million. Um, and then just to hit on a few more points, um, the lead concentration exceeded the benchmark for aquatic life downstream from cliffside at all the sites. Um, and then we talked about this before, the, um, the tap water, the lead concentrations found in the tap water was almost double the EPA action level. Um, and then chromium in the, in the sediment significantly increased downstream from American zinc products. 
Um, but again, there is no criteria exceeded. Um, but that is an interesting trend. Um, and another thing um, that we found from the 2019 study is there were no significant differences in metal concentrations between fish. And a lot of that ha probably has to do with the fact that we didn't get a very um, well-rounded um, species data. data. So this, this year that we went down, we mostly caught um, catfish and sunfish via electrofishing, um, and we only caught one bass. But um, as you look higher in the trophic level, you will find, you know, generally you will find um, higher concentrations in metals in fish tissue because um, they're consuming, like they're at the top of the food chain, so they're consuming these um, smaller organisms um, in that, you know, that process of bioaccumulation. So um, definitely we have some goals for 2020 to improve and get a really, really good picture of what exactly is um, going down there <laughs> at the broad. Um, so to put this in the human perspective, um, there were elevated levels of arsenic and selenium in the fish tissue, um, and they were high enough to put restrictions on safe monthly consumption. Um, so for cadmium, even though the levels ex exceeded, um, um, or the levels were high of cadmium, um, they, they didn't really exceed any criteria, um, but for selenium, um, it, it brought the fish consumption down to about 16 fish per month. Um, but, but uh, for arsenic, um, we, we have a much uh, more narrow window or, you know, narrow number for the amount of fish that you can safely consume. Um, so for the non-cancer endpoint, um, it's about four fish or, okay, so you can eat about four fish um, at a serving size of four ounces per month at the reference site. Um, so all the way up past American zinc products, but um, once you get below um, cliffside, um, the recommended amount would be two fish per month um, based on the amount of arsenic found in the fish tissue that we collected. Um, and then for arsenic as a cancer endpoint, um, it would be recommended that no fish are consumed. Um, and the non-cancer endpoint basically mean, it just um, means that that's a safe number to consume, but there might be chronic systematic um, systemic uh, impacts maybe later on down the road. Um, so yeah, not not the news everyone wants to hear. But that's what we found, and based on EPA's. Um, recommended amounts and the way that they calculate their fit like and calculate and do and analyze their data for fish tissue um, studies. This is what we found. Um, and then for next steps, um, again, we would really like to obtain a more well-rounded data set um, and kind of fill those gaps that we're missing. Um, I think one of the goals that David and I share um, is just to work with community members and share this information um, because the more that you're able to voice um, your concerns and get involved, um, the more change that inevitably happens. Um, I think a lot of times things go on in, in people's backyards and they don't know, but when they know, um, it, it's a real, um, it's a real shocker and you want to do something about it. And then another thing we would like to do is just share this information with government organizations to issue fish tissue or fish consumption advisories. Um, so right now, this this information is not available. Um, yeah, because there have haven't been many other fish tissue studies, or if any, um, hardly none on the broad. So this information is not available, and I'm it's not published either. So I take that with a grain of salt. But um, with a more well-rounded data set, we would, we would like the power of that in the future. Yeah. Do you have anything to add as far as conclusions or next steps, David? Um, yeah, just that it would be uh, really nice if we had a data set substantial enough to present to 
uh, EPA or uh, DHHS so that they could issue accurate consumption advisories to let the people know. I mean, we know there is, there is a risk, there is some risk um, to eating a lot of fish. So we know that a few fish is probably okay, but it would be nice for our government um, organizations to kind of make that official uh, to, to give more credit to yours and my work and also to protect our citizens who eat those fish. Yeah, well said. And um, just a few acknowledgements. So um, this work wouldn't be able to be done without Dr. Tuberty. Um, and he, he's done a lot of work with Cole Ash and Cole, he was uh, one of the responder or like scientists on the TVA coal ash spill in Kingston. Um, and he, he's just really done some amazing work. And then of course, David for inviting us um, and working with us for so many years now. And Guy Hutchins for always being a lovely host. Um, he's hosted us every year that we've come down and um, it's really wonderful to have um, a friendly local and just really nice um, access to the river. And yeah, it's great. Um, and then uh, other people that were in the ecotoxicology class that joined us, we have Christina Sanders, and um, she and I worked really closely on this. And um, she actually presented this data at a um, CTAC conference, which is Chemical Society of Environmental Toxicology um, at the International Meeting in Toronto last year. So she has really done some amazing work and has gone on to work for Fish and Wildlife. Um, as a fish biologist, um, Lauren Rader, um, Michelle Ortiz, and um, William McMahon, or Mac, and then Summer Wong John. And then Dr. Carol Babiak is, is our contact at App State um, and gives us access to the chemistry department to be able to process our, our ICP samples. So we really wouldn't be able to do this work without her. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions for right now, but one of my questions is how can just a normal everyday citizen get more involved with protecting the river and the fish? Well, you can have to be a true member for starters. And we'll send you newsletters on what's happening with all sorts of opportunities for engagement, whether, whether that's volunteer work or going to, you know, to like these public meetings that I mentioned or that surrounded the Cosad Coal Ash controversy. There are lots of opportunities to show up for these kinds of public input meetings that will then chart the course for the health and wellness of our environment. So um, yeah, just stay in touch with us at Mountain True and you can find my email address on the Mountain True website page and the other river keepers. And um, yeah, just make contact is the first thing and, and um, talk to other people in your community and see if they'd like to get involved. And as soon as we get over this uh, COVID thing, we'll start doing some, uh, some more outings together and I look forward to seeing you on the water. I did want to add too, Hannah mentioned that um, during that first year of the fish tissue study, the access was pretty difficult and indeed access in the Broad River has been very limited for the 30 miles that I've been paddling the Broad River. I mean, basically had to either know somebody or just put in under a bridge or trespass, which I don't do, you know, we don't do that, but that's all changing. We, we've got uh, at least two new canoe accesses coming in the next year or so at Highway 221 and 221A. Uh, Rutherford County has two brand new North Carolina wildlife access points. And um, of course, there's our Broad River Greenway in Bowling Springs, which is an outstanding um, 
jewel in the crown of our Cleveland County Park system. And then along the first broad here, closer to my home, uh, we're continuing to gain access, public access as well. So we have some maps that we can share with you if you're interested in um, looking into that and getting on the river to fish and swim and paddle. So yeah, thanks for moving along. And um, like I said, I just, I look forward to the day when I can tell people that, yeah, it's okay. You can eat those fish and not have to worry about it. But I'd like to eat them again too. <laughs> well, thank you both, Hannah and David, for presenting this and giving us the opportunity to discuss a lot of your work. Um, I also want to say thank you to everybody else who's attended and taken their time out of their day to come hear about a lot of the work that Mountain True does. Um, if you are interested in seeing any more Mountain True University um, past videos, you can find them on our website, which is www.mountaintrue.org. Um, and we hope to see you at our next Mountain True University meeting. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Cassidy. Thanks, Cassidy. Thanks, Hannah. Bye, buddy. Have a great day. Pleasure working with y'all.